Okay, tonight, a curious word, likeness. Mm. Behind that are all problems. It's the most central, basic notion of the entire intellectual world. It's the fundamental principle of creation. This is a quote from the Timaeus, Plato's Timaeus. God, or the demiurgos, the creator, maker, really, rather than a creator. He desired that all should be, so far as possible, like unto himself. This principle, is regarded by all the wise, above all as the supreme originating principle of becoming and the whole cosmos, the whole universe. It's a controlling idea. It's the condition. Remember, we use the word condition. We're going to use it tonight. Would you not agree that an artist, an artist, right, a painter, that kind of an artist, he has to have an idea of what it is he's going to execute, to fashion. That's his model. It could, in fact, be something rather beautiful, such as what I'm able to draw from my superior art. In any case, he must focus his mind on that model. And then if he has sufficient skill, mastery of a skill, he can then bring into existence a copy. Unless there was the possibility, the condition for likeness, this could never happen. The necessary condition for all of this is the property of likeness. It's the fundamental concept. Now, in Plato, of course, all you have to do is create out of this painter. We'll put in here now the Demiurgos, God the Maker. Father Maker, sometimes called. And the cosmos or the universe then comes into existence. That's only possible if therefore there is in some sense an image here, a model. Therefore the mind of God is the basic model of the universe. The mind of God is sometimes called the forms. Because in the creating of the universe, everything in the universe, therefore, if the principle of all creation is likeness, therefore it follows that whatever you discover here as a recurring form or pattern must have come into existence on the basis of some model Oh, the model, fancy <coughs> word for the model, is the forms. <coughs> so therefore, in the whole development of man, we can use man as an example. And where he's going, his whole destiny, both coming into existence and passing out of existence, that whole thing 
is the idea of man. Now, the idea of man is this curious thing called form. And by the way, when Plato talks about it, it's invariably in the plural forms, not singular forms. Now, we can save a lot of difficulty if we just understand the idea of form not as the image, not as the image of a seal that stamps out images, a pattern, cookie cutter, pattern for a dress, blueprint, because that is static and lifeless. We're going to introduce another idea for the idea of form, which is going to be much more interesting. But now, in order to play with this, we have to go back and take a look at something. We want to continue what we did last week and bring it forward. So therefore, let me awaken your memory for a moment. Uh, ah, thank you. Wrong order. Primarily what we were doing last time is saying there is something the ultimate called the good or the one. Now, in any development or creative process that unfolds, each particular stage that is unfolded, each particular stage, bears a relationship to its former as model is to copy. Therefore, throughout the entire universe, there's nothing other than, in an unfolding process, the idea of likeness. Well, last time, therefore, we said there's something called the good of the one. That's our ultimate term. And necessarily from the good, if there's an activity, if the good has any power at all, it brings into existence goodness on the side of the good and from the one, unity. Therefore, goodness is a unity. The kind of unity we're talking about is a goodness. Now, last time we said goodness as a rather peculiar thing here because it's not just a generalized idea of goodness, but there are five basic, or six, depending upon how we want to, to phrase one of them, basic but functions. E the goodness functions. Goodness functions in a variety of ways. Each one of the ways is a particular function. And its particular function brings about a particular good or kind of good. Therefore, we call them before these functions of goodness bring about a perfecting, a protecting, a preserving, a purifying, a turning about, and a vitalizing. And each of these is an individuation of goodness, a particular, particular form of goodness. And they function as a unity, though particular accents on each one. Therefore, taking it as a unity, taking it as a unity, therefore, functions, right, pardon me, that unity of goodness functions and gives the, and gains the name of providence. That's what we said last time, right? That's what we went. Now, see these terms? You know them by heart now, right? There are four of them. Four Ps, right? Perfecting, protecting, preserving, purifying, turning about, and vitalizing. Sometimes you can talk about protecting and preserving as similar. But whether you break them apart or you consider them, those are the basic sets. Each one is a particular function of goodness. Taken together as an activity, that's the name given to providence. Now, something is rather curious about this. This idea of likeness now we call the form. Well, a form is the particular content. The forms are the content of the intelligence.
Now look here, we can take a look at this again. We can say, what is this that's the, that is the ultimate term, the good, the one? It, it, radiates, it radiates goodness and unity. If it radiates goodness and unity, then by necessity there must be a turning upon itself. In that turning upon itself, Therefore, there's a procession and a return. It has a vitalizing factor. It's perfecting. Look, you know what else it's doing? You see, when it returns to its source, therefore, at that, that metaphysical point of returning to its source, that's insight. Okay? That's the operation of intuition. That's recognizing its source. That's recognizing its source, right? That's recognizing its source means that it has discovered its origin. And therefore its origin is real, and this is what is metaphysically called the birth of being. Being, with a capital B. And since it's a, a recognizing, necessarily there's an intellect involved in it, returns to its origin, ah, being, there's a vitality to the entire process since it's dynamic. Therefore, what naturally emerges out of goodness and unity is what we call intelligence, vitality, usually, traditionally, you can talk about, therefore, this third realm as being, intelligence, vitality, for shorthand, you can call it being. For shorthand, you can call it intelligence. Now, I want to talk about this man again. We're saying in this being intelligent vitality, there are these curious things called forms. And by heavens, we named two so far. We named likeness and man. Well, <laughs> What's the relationship between this form man and you and I here now? Well, what we're going to try to show is why it can be said that the very individuating process of providence through those five or six ideas necessarily comes together into a form. And then, the same qualities emerge in soul. Each step, however, a further refinement and diminution. Going upwards, it has a gains rather than diminution. So let's see if we can make sense of what I just said. All right, let's try it. What are we going to do? While we're talking, we're talking about two ideas. Forms, by the way, the word forms, a better word for it is ideas with a capital I, to distinguish it from mere thoughts. Now we have to show why it deserves the capital I and why when we use the word form we should be very careful that we don't mean merely a shape or a semblance of something. We have to be careful about that. So then, forms are no form. Number one, a form ain't no form. It's something far more than model and copy. Because it has a power. All forms have a power. This entire model has a power. It bestows, right? It, it's bestowing likeness is only one function of the forms. Forms really are, watch now we have another five. I bet you're going to say they're similar. That's right. Right. I, good heavens, there's another one. I, what did I do here, Pierre? Uh, productive in the sense that it's generative. Origin. Okay. Therefore, in the mind of God, in the mind of the damn Aragos, 
There is the ideas. They're the forms or the model for creation. Therefore, in the mind of God is this form, man. All that man ever was, is, and will be is contained in that form. Now, it's not a blueprint, we said. It's not a blueprint. It's productive. This is what produces the particular man. It has a generative power. It's productive. But it also, you see, since it has a vitality, it also continues, see, it continues in time to influence its particular, uh, its particular generations, you see. There is such a thing as man, the idea of man. It isn't a blueprint that remains aloof and indifferent, like a blueprint is, but it continues its power and its force through each of the particulars. Therefore, you see, it is perfective. It's trying to perfect man. It's trying to perfect everything within man as man lives. And it preserves what has been developed. It's a preserving function. It preserves what has been. And therefore, it protects man in being what man is. Therefore, it keeps him together and it accumulates all of the, the evolutionary development. So therefore, we can say it has a vitality, right? It keeps it all together. It's a coherence. It offers a protection to keep what's solid and developed. It preserves that into the future. And it has a perfective force. Therefore, it's not merely model copy. Right. When people think of forms as merely being, there are many chairs, and therefore is the, there is the idea of chair. That's not a form. That's model copy. Form must have these other properties with it, or it's not what Plato and the Neoplatonists are talking about when they talk about forms. Now look here. Remember when we said that each of the particular individuated forms of providence take on those different names? And we said, well, they operate as a unity. It's providence. When these function together, when these function together, when these function together, in the unfoldment of all that is within man, then it's a form. See, in providence it's general, totally general, totally general, yet reaches down and Remember when we did the dream work, it reaches down to particular. How does it reach down particularly? It must know, it must know the idea of man. It works through man, right? Providence works through man. Well, then the idea of man must be what it's working through, because it must know all of the properties of man generally, and can therefore, can bring about that providential aspect through the idea of man, or the form of man, to the particular man. When it brings it down to the particular man, then all of those great qualities that we call the individuation of providence, now in a more diminu diminutive form, lesser form, but still carrying some of the very same ideas, now operate within the idea of man, horse, whatever it is that's living. Now. If this is the case, what do we have as our goal? I mean, what, so what? Well, here's what. We're talking about what is called in Plato's world, the dialectic. What's the task of the dialectic? It's to contemplate those primary entities employing pure conceptions. Now, what are the primary entities? Look here, you can't do any work you can't do any meaningful work unless you have an idea of the nature of man. I mean, what is the nature of man? When you get and reflect on that, now you're contemplating primary entities. When you're talking about the nature of man, what are you talking about? You're talking about something that is being perfected over time, that's unfolding over time. 
And what is it that's unfolding in time? That is man's capacity, man's capacity, look here. Man's capacity, here are the intelligent, here's the soul and body. That's us. Because all of these providential forms, providential entities I should call them, are doing one thing, they're trying to perfect man. Perfecting man means what? To gain a realization of the realm of being, intelligence, and vitality. Why? So then you can then proceed and gain an insight, that's right, until finally returning to the origin. Therefore, the, the very act of creation, metaphysically considered, also takes place in the development of man as man seeks his own nature. And seeking his own nature, he recapitulates the metaphysical processes that brought about creation in the first place. Goes through each of the stages. Therefore, what is man? Man is a knowing thing. Man is a knowing thing. Now, it's a special kind of knowing thing. It's a special kind of knowing thing because he has to go beyond knowledge to gain something more significant. But he's a knowing thing and he has to be brought to realize that he has to go beyond knowing. Well, what is it to go beyond knowing? To go beyond knowing means that you're in the intuitive realm. Right? You're in the intuitive realm. And what is the mark of the intuitive realm? It's when the subject, the act of, the, the, whether it's when the intellect and the, and the intellect functioning and the object of the intelligible is one. It's a unity. That's intuitive. That's the important part, right? Okay, what do I mean then? Man is a knowing thing. There's a kind of knowing where the subject and object are always different. That's knowledge. Intuitive, how are we using that word? We're using intuitive in the sense of only one thing. And that is this model, you see? That's this model. Because in this return to the source, one recognizes one's own being as essentially the same as what is seeing it. And in seeing it, one recognizes there's no difference between it. That's a moment of intuition. That's what man is. Man goes through all his struggles to try to come back to just one thing his own origin, which is nothing other than the cosmic unfolding of man in the universe. Therefore, see, what's the goal of the dialectic? It's to contemplate these primary entities, man, likeness, providence, being, intelligence, vitality, goodness, unity, the nature of the good and the one. Why? There's only one assumption that's working here, and that is the intellectual comprehension of these things prepares you for vision. It's not just an intellectual game. It's a preparation for vision. It allows a person to, to recognize that they can be receptive to in a caring universe where knowing is playing a major role, right? And what kind of knowing? An intuitive knowing that grasps the entire thing into a high unity, right? Now, The difficulty in this whole process is that it is difficult to do this. And therefore, Proclus and Plotinus and Plato always say, look here, relations are, are constant, the terms vary. If you want to understand something, look at the images, grasp the images so you can then return to the model. Start with the images, look for the shapes, work your way back. Recognizing each time you work back, of course, there's a nice quantum jump between each level. So therefore, in defining and dividing in our process of understanding these things, we must first look to the images of the things we are exploring. Now, what do we mean by a form, then, likeness? It's not an object of knowledge, because it's only by intuition and rational exploring that we, come to, we, we can come to recognize that there's something there and our words try to shape it and identify it. It must be simple. It's all of these very simple things. So what do we want to say it contains? 
want to say it's paradigmatic, that is to say it is capable of generating things like itself. It's generative. As we said before, it's the cause of completion. And in doing it, hey, it confers goodness, doesn't it? Why, it's these very same ideas, the, what we call the individuation of goodness that we mentioned, that now reappear as part of the dynamics behind each one of these forms. Each one of these forms, man, dog, tree, anything living, can be said to fall into a class, and that class therefore can be said to be a form. But all of this taken together on the highest level contains those operating, individuating processes of goodness as its motive power working on the particular thing. So therefore, there is the idea of man, paradigmatic aspect. It generates things that look like men, right? It's generative. It has the power of producing them. It's the cause of completion. Man is not just man. Man must be completed by reflecting back on his source. Therefore, it has the possibility, it has the, necessarily, it confers goodness on its quest. Therefore, what do we say? Fruition preserves. It's the cause of their being. It's cooperative, it's cohesive, and it unifies man. Ah, now look. Now, when we are talking about likeness, likeness fits in. All right, now we're now talking about the realm of the form, so let me do that now. All right. What is this curious thing called the realm of ideas or forms? It's the conditions for everything. It's the conditions for creation. It's the conditions for everything. Therefore, there are a set of ideas. Being, right, motion, rest, same, other. Fundamental ideas. And then man, ox, etc., living things that can be said to be part. Now, of course, we might add a page to this in modern thought. We would say wherever the evolutionary force takes us, things change, but we'll leave it this way for the moment. Now, there's a middle range. There's a middle range to these things called forms, which I prefer to call ideas with a capital I. You see why we're calling them and why it deserves a capital I? It's not merely a thought if it has all of those powers not a thought in someone's mind. It has a, a creative function, an organizing function, a protecting function, perfecting on the highest level. Therefore, it's not merely a thought. There it just, therefore, it deserves capital I. Now, what do we put in here? Likeness, greatness. They're all nesses. Although, the, in English we can't put it, but it should be beautiness, but I'll just put beauty. And it should be just, justness, but we use the word justice. These four are called the organizing ideas, All right, and that's why we want to talk about them. They're called in the middle range, and let's see if we can make sense of them. Let's do it this way. Every man wants to be more perfect. Every man has a model, something he's struggling for to achieve. And therefore, no matter who he is or what he is, that's what he's after, he, she. That's what, that's what he's after. Now, all our confusion comes is when, of course, when uh, you have the wrong model or you're not able to achieve it. But nonetheless, man being man, he strives for the better. Whether it's a better cup of coffee, whether it's better shoes, whether it's a better job, whether life being better, we always struggle for something that we want to regard as better. Now look here. That means we want to become like this. 
See, we want to become like that. Therefore, the very idea of likeness is a principle within our reality that does something. Right? It renders secondary things like primary. This is the primary. Right? Here we are, secondary. It's the motive power within us <clears throat> that seeks to realize that model. Therefore, it, likeness, the very condition of likeness, renders secondary things like primary. It's the driving power behind it. It's the single tie that holds all things together. And because these four chairs over there are like one another, if there wasn't the condition for likeness, those four chairs couldn't be together. Mother and father, children, all things that are created and are generated have a likeness. If it weren't for likeness, things would not be together. Therefore, a likeness, the fundamental property of likeness, holds all things together. But look here. You can't have the idea of likeness, and things aren't driven by likeness, unless there's a sense of difference between the two, and you would rather have the higher. That's why you want to become like something. Therefore, a likeness necessarily, necessarily involves the idea of greater. Necessarily does the idea. It's built into the very idea, the quest, the development. What do we mean by greatness? Now, greatness is that thing which gives preeminence to anything in its particular class. That's what it is. Right? It gives preeminence to anything in a particular class. In any class of things, you'll always find something that is preeminently more like that member, more like the class itself than others. That others can be judged by it and fall away, fall short from it, but there's always something that preeminently can be said to exhibit the qualities of the member in that class. Right? All the members in the class. Therefore, it's the cause of excellence and superior quality, wherever it is in all grades of being. Right. Therefore, if you and I want to gain, we want to become like something, model ourselves, become better, that presupposes there is in the nature of our reality this power of greatness. Because when we get there, we expect to be preeminently like that thing that we want to struggle to be like. And therefore, greatness necessarily must be there. But wait a minute. What do you want to do it for? Why? Why? Curiously enough, we want it because we want to be better on all levels, and to be better and exhibit and exhibit that quality, to exhibit that quality, all right? to exhibit it, to show it, to display it, to be willing to, to let it go, to let see it, to drop all the nonsense, right? to drop all the games, to, to display it. That's the moment of beauty. That is beauty. That's what beauty is. Therefore, necessarily, you have to introduce the idea of beauty as one of the major ideas that are governing our reality and the nature of our reality is a metaphysical reality of goodness. Therefore, it dispenses symmetry, see? It has a unity, a charm, perfection. And therefore, most essentially, by the way, it shows itself most clearly through the mind, through the mind, because that's what we really want to see. We want to see beauty through the mind, whether it's basketball playing, we want to see someone who can see the opportunity, seize the opportunity, play the best possible game, and use the mind so skillfully that we're amazed at the dexterity and the goal that he achieves, right? That's what we want to see. We want to see beauty, right? So wait a minute. Not without justice, because we want, we want this this achievement to be fair. No fairness in reality, no reality worth mentioning. Therefore, in that struggle, fairness is the hallmark of the entire pursuit. Otherwise, there'd be no point in trying to become like something that doesn't make the person who was going to become like better. Better in what sense? Why well, better in the way the person is. How's that? Justice. Therefore, Justice is the cause of all of these things working properly, so that each functions most perfectly. That's what fairness is. It means that you're doing what's right, the model is right for you, 
right? The greatness you want to achieve is perfect for you, right? It brings about a better condition and it's right for that to be the way it is. Therefore, through the whole thing is fairness. That's another word for justice. Therefore, each, each of these has a particular f activity and function. But you know what? Are you beginning to see something curious? Each implies the other, doesn't it? Each implies the other. See, rationally we can distinguish them, but they have a unity. Rationally we can make these distinctions, and I'm appealing to, to kind of awaken you uh, to take the trip with me so that you can kind of get an intuition of what I'm saying, because we do not agree the idea of likeness, therefore, presupposes these operating together in a unity. By the way, didn't we say that same thing about the individuated forms of goodness last week? When, because when they come together as a unity, that's providence, that's one thing. When these come together, they must always be together, though they may function more in respect to one side than the other, but they must all function together, and therefore that's why Plato talks about the doctrine of forms. And he talks about forms, plural, because they are not separate, separate one from the other, cluttering the metaphysical landscape. It is a brilliance. Now let's put that into it. You see, if all of these are functioning on the highest level, and one therefore is seeing this with all of these qualities, then in that seeing, that's of course what Plato calls the most brilliant light of being. Right? Now, what that <laughs> suggests, amazing thing of course, is that someone has an experience of the most brilliant light of being, and wants to know what it was they experienced. Only a rational analysis of that will bring out all of these factors. It's only a careful analysis will bring to birth all of these ideas that are implicit within it. That's the goal of the dialectic. To make intelligible this experience. Because from this experience, we want to go the next and the next, that without which, that, that has no object at all. Right. And that's why this goes on in the Platonic realm, for one purpose, to sharpen the mind, to allow it to, to understand where these different experiences are, how to understand them, and most important of all, why it presupposes a higher. Because, let's see if we can do it together. All right. Kind of Christmas time. That uh, gigantic image in the New Testament of uh, uh, the transfiguration. Uh, in, uh, they're, in all, in, uh, they're only in three of the Gospels. John doesn't have this scene for very interesting reasons. But primarily it's Mark. Mark was the original Gospel. Others were copied from it. In chapter 9, pardon me? Oh, okay. In chapter 9, Jesus takes uh, <clears throat> three of his disciples up to the mountaintop, and there is a magnificent outpouring of luminosity out of which out of which comes Moses and Elijah and they have a conversation together in that brilliant luminosity through it by the way this is the first resurrection this is really resurrection bringing out of the dead because Moses appears and Elijah appears and they talk with one another and I assure you, that must have been one of the great dialogues in history. Right? I mean, in all fairness, that must have been one heck of a talk. I've often speculated on that, by the way, what kind of a talk they must have had. But let's now go back into it, all right? Brilliant light of being. What we are going to see, whether it's natural, that we're going to use these very terms we just used. Let's see if we can do it. Would you agree... It has to be beautiful. <laughs> it has to be most beautiful. Right? We, that's easy to put in. We'll put that in first, right? Yeah. 
Now, would you agree in such an experience, I will go further and say, in it you cannot conceive of anything greater. Therefore, it necessarily has the mark of greatness. In such an experience, it is impossible to conceive that there can be anything greater. In that experience, it has to have the sense that everything is perfect just the way it is. It's perfect just being the way it is. That's justice. That's justice, see? That's justice. Fairness. Eh? It, hey, being there, it's just to be there, it's perfectly being there, it's right to be there, it's even right to, to penetrate it or to endure it or participate in it even more fully. Now, you know what? It's, it is the kind of a thing which in that experience you recognize that that is the core of reality. Of which you are part and parcel of. No difference, right? No difference in that sense. The core of reality, it admits of degrees, can be experienced to uh, more and less degrees, of course, but in the sense that it's the core of reality then, it's that which holds all things together. Because that's the bond of being. That's the bond of being. But when one recognizes it, you know what one recognizes? That it's, it's not the, when one says they recognize that it's part and parcel of themselves, they don't mean their big toe, they mean in respect to the mind. And therefore, it's necessarily that therefore, that being therefore, and intelligence, and it has a fantastic vitality, we know that. Therefore, one recognizes in it that that's the kind of stuff that has made that entering into that makes perfect. It is perfective. It makes perfect. And what makes perfect is nothing other than likeness. It renders secondary things like the primary. That's what it does. And therefore, through this experience and by playing with it in these terms, we can begin to see how this one idea, likeness, involves these others together into a unity, and that unity then by analysis can be seen to be inferred from the experience of the most brilliant light of being. Now, The forms, therefore, that's the unifying cause of all things. It's the active power that brings things in and perfects them. But it depends upon the receptivity of the things. It isn't something that we become puppets through which the divine functions. No, no. It requires our receptivity to, the, the, to these very things. Therefore, the whole creation is nothing other than a unified fulfillment. One, the forms. Two, our reception to it. In that union, there is a communication, there is a sharing, and that's the kind of a union that brings about the perfection of man and the, and the cosmos. Now, what do we mean by likeness? What's in it? How can we explore it by this curious word, dialectic? Let me play with this for a moment. All right, let me play with it for a moment. What can we now define as, as the things necessary, the ideas necessary to understand the idea of likeness? Does it have a set to, a set of ideas, right, which together can be represented as likeness? Yes. How shall we do it? The dialectic proceeds through 24 categories. Now that sounds very involved, but it isn't, as you'll see. 12 are positive, so we've already divided to <laughs> 12 positive, 12 negative. 
There are only four things we're talking about. There are only four things we're talking about. Four classes is all we're going to be talking about. So all you have to do is just recognize the four classes we're going to talk about. By the way, the four classes you can say three things about. For any of the classes, you can say something that's true, something that's false, and something that is both true and false. So let's see what we have. What are the four classes? You can make a statement that reflects and is concerned only with itself. All you're talking about is itself. <clears throat> the thing itself. <clears throat> By the way, you can talk about that thing that you just described and its relationship to other things. And by the way, if you can talk about this, whatever it's going to be, and its relationship to other things, you can then go the next step and say, well, wait a minute. What is the impact that this has on each other? Just among themselves. its effect on others, among themselves. Now, wait a minute. If these things then are so affected by that, then how are they then going to relate back to the original idea? That's the dialectic. You can talk about likeness or man, the idea of man relationship to other things, how it is among other things, and how the other things are back. You can say this about something that you can say exists, and you can also talk about it as not existing. Now well, look here, what do you have? Right. Likeness. We need some ideas to define likeness. If likeness exists, what is its effect on other things? If it has an effect on other things, what effect does it have among themselves, independently of the idea itself? And what's the effect it has upon itself? You can say three things about it. You can say things that are true about it. You can say things about that are false about it. You can say things that are both. And you can repeat this four times. Right. Therefore, three, six, nine, twelve, if it exists. Assume it doesn't exist. What do you have? Another twelve. Together, twenty-four. Ha! Now look here. What are we going to do? We're going to see whether you can talk about likeness in these different ways. Now, it's going to be easier than you think. Because I already did it. Thank goodness Proclus did it for us. But I would like to introduce something to you. We've been talking about likeness. We've been talking about the idea of model and copy. Another way of talking about it is model and image. So I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to let you see how Proclus talks about likeness in these 24 ways. And then I'm going to give you an image of it so that you can see the very idea of likeness appearing in the very thing we're talking about, which is the idea of likeness. How are we going to do it? Well, luckily enough, uh, Could you pass this, please? You're welcome, most welcome.
Okay, now, what I've given you are some copies of uh, Proclus's analysis of likeness. All right, you'll have that. You can look at it later, All right? Now, I'm going to make a copy of that. I'm going to make a copy of that. I'm going to tell you a story that has all of these metaphysical ideas in it. Then you'll be able to take the model likeness and see how you can put it into an image and how easy it is to keep the image. Now, this is how, what we're doing. Yeah, page 27. No, One more. Page 31. 27, yeah. 27. Just had 30. 30. Okay. Would you please take a look at page 365? Gosh, I did uh, the wrong one. Did I do the wrong one? Oh, I did the dialectic on the providence. Ah, I gave the, I took the wrong stack. Ah, okay, I'll play it by ear. Okay, it's okay. I'll do it. I'll show you how to do it. More fun this way. Let's take page 27. It's a story. It's a story. Now, in this story are nothing other than the categories of providence, appropriately, the categories of likeness. Um, You see, um, isn't that curious? I, I put together providence and likeness in my mind, and they are very similar. <laughs> I like that. So this is a story I created. Now, I created this story so that you can take something very abstract and difficult to understand or keep in your mind, and I took the very ideas and I structured it so you could just put it into a story. If you remember the story, you have the whole idea. So then, I think it might be fair if I just go through quickly a couple of lines and you'll see. Um, the beginning is suggestive. So the story is of two kingdoms. One is going to be positive, and the other one's going to be negative. And the beginning of the discussion after the first paragraph. 
Indeed, quite recently I was present at a moment like this when the discussion turned on the question, at the moment of your death, has your destiny been shaped by what you have done with what you brought with you? It was at such a moment that one of the mountain men, Agathon as he was called, came in and after exchanging greetings, a place was made for him to sit down comfortably. Agathon was respected highly for his opinion on a variety of curious subjects. And he it was who spun out the tale I'm about to tell you. He said his tale would be for our benefit if we could find out how and where to apply it. I'll mention later the uh, effect this story had on some of us. But since I am more interested in sharing it with you, I'll, I'll leave my own reflections upon it for even a later time. He began in a low voice, penetrated the air, brought everyone's attention to a fine point. I'll tell you a tale of two domains, and after hearing it, tell me how they both can be used to bring about a benefit to us all. First, I must tell you that one of the domains was able to flourish right? because it had an unlimited source of power. So that whatever needed to be done could be accomplished perfectly. Everything was brought to a level where, it, where its goodness was clearly manifest. Now, you go through it and, and just notice the terms that are being used, collect those terms, put them alongside of each one of these, and you will have through this story the key ideas that develop this notion. So therefore, if you learn a couple of stories like this, keep the stories in your head, they should fit together coherently, you should then be able to reflect on the stories, and you know what you're reflecting on? One of the forms. Well, as I say, I took the, <laughs> I apologize for this, I took the wrong stack, I took the stack on providence instead of likeness, and my rush to get out and my time was occupied by a variety of curious things this afternoon. Uh, so, uh, so what we'll do is that we'll just play with the first two sets and then we'll go into likeness and I'll show you the relationship between the two of them. We can create another story. All right, that'll be fun to do. Look here. First, I must tell you that one of the domains was able to flourish because it had an unlimited source of power, right? Power, unlimited, unlimited power, right? So that it, it could accomplish everything perfectly, right? So it could accomplish all. Everything was brought to a level where its goodness was clearly manifest. It accomplished and manifest with this power all that lie there potentially within it. Hey, those are the three major ideas that define providence. Since its purpose and its will were in harmony, its will was unbending. These are the things you can say that are true about it, see? And you can't say that there's any way that its will can be bent out of its purpose. As a result, once the will was set upon accomplishing its noble purpose, nothing could turn it aside. The domain was, in a certain sense, a one, since it brought everything together. But in another sense, it was not one, because they were things that brought together. Look, see, what are we saying? For each one of these things, we can find something true, false, and both true and false about it. I'll go through one more and then I'm going to move. Now, in this domain, there was a ruler. The second, remember what we did before when we said about the second? What's its effect on others? Therefore, this category, the second category, is always a ruling function. And I picked it up here. In this domain, there was a ruler whose vision was such that the ruler was able to bring everything to its conclusion perfectly. Right? That's what it was able to do. 
This was as it should be, since the ruler's vision had within its grasp the beginning and end of all that was under his domain. Equally, it was not at all difficult for him to best preserve each one of his subjects as it was fit for them to be. That's how he functioned. As a result, his watchful rule was known at the time when no man injured another. Nor was there anything in the entire domain that was unexpected. Indeed, it was apparent to all that this ruler cannot be said to be the cause of any disorder through this realm. Have a story? Now let me move to <clears throat> Proclus. Nature of providence is, in relationship to itself, it's of the nature of the good, goodness, being infinite in power, having effective capability. What you can't say about it, what, that will not be true of it, that it's being turned aside from its purpose, that it lacks will. Is that in the story? This is the way he defines it dialectically. The story matches it with each point in the story. It picks up one of these ideas, doesn't it? Now, what if we did the same for likeness? That's what we were going to do. And Okay. This is... Uh if likeness exists, there must be singleness, eternity, productiveness, primacy. We can take these ideas now and we can create another story based upon likeness. In other words, you can take each of these forms, the major ideas in Plato, and you can create a story where in the story you have highlighted, highlighted each of the ideas. So therefore, if you come to grasp a whole set of very simple stories, the stories will be the copy or an image of the model. The model will have the dialectical terms you need. And I was going to uh, bring you a section on likeness, only I brought providence instead. And um, that, that's kind of, isn't that kind of humorous? <laughs> if all of life was predictable like you were implying there, wouldn't it be a bit boring? To, to find the difference between the two? Everything is predictable. He said a true ruler would make everything predictable. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's not going to be the world's greatest drama. <laughs> the only thing, see, all you want is a framework where you can put the ideas in so that the, the, the domains themselves can be so idyllic that no state such as that will ever exist. But in creating a story, though, that has all of those terms, you have a context in which you can see the terms. Oh, you're quite right. It'd be boring. I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> but in terms of 
in terms of presenting the ideas, it would contain it all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, there were certain stages, is what you're saying, like stages of evolution or stages of yeah. maturity, uh -huh. growing and maturity, we yeah. go through it. Mem mnemonic device. Yeah, it could be a, a, an interesting device to present it that way. But, so therefore, I'd say, uh, I made an image of the copy of the model. Because Proclus gives us the, the model, I made copies of it for you, and then I made a story of the image of it. Only, as I say, I brought, good thing I brought providence. I wonder whether that was providential. So, uh, maybe then we can uh, shift gears. And the last time we were here, remember we went through a dream, and this uh, young lady here had a, a dream, and she was going to tell us, was she not? Maybe we can pull that into likeness. Think we might be skillful enough to do that? Let's try it. You went back over the tape. Could you uh, yes. tell us what you discovered? Uh, well, that part of the story was pretty close, except there was uh, uh, a couple of additions that, that namely when I was crossing the street, all the people were coming out of uh, an ambulance. And, and the boys had come and came out of an ambulance. And I don't know how that fit in, but. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, they mentioned a couple, the, I got back the words that the kids said. They said that uh, you weren't following the rules because I had crossed against the red light. Wow. To cross the street. And I agreed with them. I said, yes, but that, they, they put it in that you don't always follow the rules. And I said, no, this was just one time. Mm -hmm. Keep going. And that, that was, uh, that was the addition. The other was the same. That is that the boys found the child of the earth and they did put it on my finger. Oh, I, they did find the child, they dug up the child of the earth, and they did put it on my finger. And I tried to take it off, and I knew that the next step was I was going to have to pull it off with my other hand. And the particular thing that we were looking at, was it not, is that uh, when you were called upon to report your state of mind, you leave out certain interesting features which allows the person to judge without that vital information since a part of it is kept or not revealed. Is that correct? Was that the one you were working on? Uh, oh, the teacher, that I didn't, uh, that I assumed that it wasn't significant or that it would be, uh, I thought that it would be the, uh, the story. I did, are you talking about my relationship with the teacher? That is what that you brought up. That I left out information because yeah. I didn't want to assume something that wasn't right or true. I mean, I didn't want to assume that something was right when it wasn't. I didn't want to assume that something was real or right. I think when you used the word real. Yeah, what? But it wasn't. At least that's what I believed. I believed it, it may not be right, so I didn't want to assume it. So guided by this principle, right. right? You then then left certain parts of the story out, is that correct? Right. Right. So therefore that guided your behavior, right? That's a principle. This is a principle. Right. Right? This is a principle. And therefore, in acting it out, you are acting out that principle in your life, right? Were you not? Right. Right, right, right. And you reflected on this since that last week? Yes. Ah, ah. Uh, are you leaving anything out now? <coughs> um. Was there a prelude to this dream that you uh, left oh, out? Uh, yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> See? Still functioning. Well, what was that? I had a whole prior dream that uh, 
a section of the dream actually that dealt with an er earthquake. Could, would you mind telling us? The whole thing? Oh, uh, Jesus. If you could stand, but you're facing all of us. I'm sorry. Your, your, your voice is muffled when you're... Okay, I'll talk louder. Uh, Thank you. Um, Maybe that affects from speech. memory, it's too bad that I don't have the dream with me. <clears throat> um, from my memory, I recall that I was looking, I was in this house, and I was standing in the portico of the house, and over, um, it was like an open portico, and a friend of mine had been, uh, to, was criticizing another person's uh, the structure of the house, because this person, that this person, that she was criticizing, she claimed, had took a lot of material, but wouldn't fit, didn't complete the house. <laughs> Just like I don't, <laughs> I don't add all this stuff. Yeah, it didn't uh, complete the house. So it made it dangerous because, and we were looking down into the basement and the steps that went down into the basement were not complete, like it was sinking because of the way it was made. And I was thinking that it was dangerous to go underneath into, under the house. It would be terrible if it was an earthquake struck. Uh, and right at that moment, there was a huge earthquake that started shaking the house and shaking the uh, uh, land. And it lasted a long time. It was a real major one. And I ran out to an open field in front of the house. And I was standing there. And I turned around and I looked at the house. And it stood. It was still standing, to my surprise, given the criticism that the person had made about the house and the, uh, and the builder. It was still stood. So it was stronger than uh, was stated. And the earthquake continued to shake. And I was thinking, oh, what about the people that were in the house, and what about my cat, and other, uh, other things I was concerned about. It seemed like everything was okay, but the uh, earthquake was, uh, and it stopped. And uh, that's all I remember. I probably left something out. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. That I recall. See, the thing we were working on, and the thing we're working on tonight, is whether or not they are fundamental ideas that we have that shape and mold our, our existence. Right? Does this function like a form? If it functions like a form, then all we have to do is recall those ideas about the form likeness and see whether it fits this principle. Let's do it. Insofar as she's being guided by this, would you agree that is preserving some image she has? It preserves this image? Isn't this image a model that she wants to adhere to? To the degree that she adheres to it, is she not then seeing herself as perfected or perfecting or being perfect or modeling herself under this means? Are you not then agreeing with that as a canon of virtue and a canon of, of uh, being? Yeah. Ah, would you not agree? That gives you a sense of protection? Yeah. Right? Gives you a false. Feels yeah. like right? Protection, right? Right? Hey, it preserves, it perfects, it protects, and it's a sense of uh, so long as you're here, you're right, aren't you? It's a purifying, is it not? Yeah, doing the right thing. Doing the right thing? Right? It has the. It, it then pulls the scattered elements together of yourself, and therefore you can now appear before others. Yeah. Why, well, wait a minute. That's really interesting. You see, look here. See what we were saying? Now look here. It's, it's productive. It's productive. Because you are like that, are you not? You're trying to become like that. As we said, it, it, it preserves, it protects, 
It brings you together as a unity. That is your model. That is your model. That's the principle. And therefore in our behavior, you see, whether we think there's a metaphysical principle of likeness, would you not agree this could not, you could not possibly be doing this if it weren't for the fact that the condition for this is likeness. This is an idea that's controlling your existence and therefore we'll call it a form with a small f. Right? Because it has no universal significance, it only has significance and purpose within the family or where you learn this. Ah, right? And therefore, this, this uh, has a survival function because it allowed you to survive at home, didn't it? This was what they wanted you to be. And so, you see, we act in the same way as creation, or we project on creation our own metaphysics or our own psychology. Because here you have a principle. On that basis, you're molding yourself to be and to do and to think. It also, it also shapes what you did experience. Now look at this, what's here, what you left out, all right? What is that saying about your house? What is this criticism? The criticism is uh, not, it's, uh, it's, it's not, not com correct. Not complete, not, complete. not correct, not correct. It's not correct. Not correct, all right? That's the criticism. Because technically, the way it was criticized, the house should have fallen. Hmm. Should have just collapsed. Yeah. Are they assuming something that wasn't real or true? Yeah, they are. Oh, were they right? No. I mean, they, they were wrong in the sense that what they assumed was wrong. That's a good... Yeah, that's a good way to judge that thing. Right, that's right, that's right. And it withstood a great shaking. Earthquake, it went on and on and on. Yeah. A great test, wasn't it? Yeah, it was definitely a test. For her to get out of the house and watch back, it had to be at least a nine. Sure. Because that's right. The quake is so fast yeah. that uh, you can't move hardly. Oh, in fact, that was part of it. It was a Thank moment you. where... I thought this is a bad earthquake, and I was yelling to the person mm. that we, you know, this is a t this is a big one because we can't move, we can't yeah. get out. Yeah, yeah. But then you I was it, but I did get out. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't have to get out. I didn't. No, that's true. I didn't. <laughs> you were going on the Assum her assumption. Of the assumption. Yeah. Ah, so right. Something. That's right. Because of this. Yeah, I believed it. You believed it? Uh -huh. So, this is what happened, this is the belief. This came before the dream that we looked at last week. Right. It was just before. Ah. That's the part I left and couldn't remember. Ah. Ah. Hmm. Wow, that is really nice. Yes. About the stairs are going down into the basement that you didn't consider safe. Well, the whole, the whole house was uh, didn't collapse, so that so was safe problem. after all. Even the weakest part was secure. Yeah, it didn't. Yeah, it didn't bother the house. It yeah. didn't bother it. No. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So. Look what we have. You, have. you have this prelude to your dream, which is, which is a criticism of this, which challenges this, 
and it takes this in particular and it reflects your experience, would you not agree that this is functioning as a great principle and it follows the same model that we have here? You see, and what's our task? Our task is to contemplate those primary ideas. So you can tell whether they're true or they're false, or there's some element of true and falsity in them, right? And how do you do it? You must look at the images. You know what the images are? Your right reflections on them. Because these ideas do have this power. But it works against your best interest, doesn't it? Right. Therefore, you know something interesting about this whole realm. We're in it naturally. We're always in it. We always operate from it. You either do it consciously so that you can see what principles there are, but you're going to work from principles, and the principles you're going to work from are going to follow the same metaphysics of a Neoplatonic metaphysician. It's exactly the same. The only difference is here, whether or not you're going to look at the image of it, because the image of it is your recollection of it, and trying to piece it together, which challenges the very thing, because the goal is to keep things out, to make sure you're... Uh, well, that I don't assume I'm making it up, or I'm, I'm making something up. I can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> the man to, him. to not... Pre to not... Uh, present something that may be false. In order to make sure that I will not say something that is false, I will consciously leave things out. Right. Doesn't make sense, but that's, a, that's true. Okay. And therefore you won't assume anything that is true or real or right. Uh, that <laughs> I certainly don't believe that it exists, I guess. It wouldn't be very difficult to judge it then. Then, what is this really saying then? I'll just put one word to it and it'll be perfect. It'll be perfect. Right. Oh. A little slight change in grammar. Look here. Someone oh. want doesn't want me <laughs> to assume something is real or right. Oh. When? when it is. When it That what? That, well, that makes sense. Oh. You do assume something was real when it is real. <laughs> That's how to go from the image to what's real. Uh -huh. huh. Well, that would fit the second part of the dream. Yeah. Huh. And so we're all metaphysicians. We're in a meta metaphysical universe. You can either have a private one that's ruling you, or you can make it conscious and decide whether those are the things you want to be, your ruler. Well, uh, I had some uh, nice sheets. I took the wrong stack for tonight, but uh, I enjoyed going through it. I would have enjoyed it more had I had my sheet on likeness distributed to you. But you do have the section on um, providence, which is very similar. I was we thought maybe we could match one against the other, but uh, I think that would run us out of time. And I think I should reflect a little more about it, because it's a nice idea to bring the two together in a story. I think I'll do it for next, next time. I mean, I'll do it anyhow. But uh. So, thank you. Thank you. Curious route? Yes, please. Um, in this model, or the models that we've been talking about for the last couple of classes, uh, where does the concept of evil, uh, how does that play in Proclus's philosophy? It doesn't. Evil does, evil's not a concept, evil's not... Not in the, see, um, would you not agree going on this principle is going to cost the young lady? Uh, turmoil, sacrifice, yeah. a lot of t difficulties, which you and I might say, looks like it's evil. Mm -hmm. But, you see, 
she thinks it's sound, she thinks it's right. Therefore, the problem is not evil ignorance. So you move the problem from evil to ignorance. Evil presupposes there's something negative in the nature of reality that's working against us. In itself. In itself. There isn't. Yeah. Well, this, yeah. this works on the assumption that, no, wait a while, wait a while, wait a while. When you misunderstand the highest principles, you're going to act out in a way that you and I might describe it as evil. But a better way would be to say that's ignorance at loose when it doesn't reflect upon itself discover the conditions of its own falsehood. Yeah. It's beautiful, it though it's not. <clears throat> Pardon? I mean, after years of Catholicism. <laughs> well, no, I assure you, there isn't too much similar between that's, this and Catholicism. No, no that's, re it's refreshing. Yeah, it's yeah, just there, it's yeah, refreshing. Yeah, I agree. Um, yes. It's just ignorance and stupidity, not, nothing is evil, inherently evil. And, and there isn't even any, in one sense, there isn't any stupidity. Oh, okay. Okay. Because, you know, um, I once was recently talking about dreams, and I've looked at thousands of dreams. And, you know, I've never found a stupid dream. That is to say, you can't take someone who you might judge to be stupid that doesn't have a magnificent dream. Order, patterns, major figures, the three elements, a logos, or a word, an action, a state of mind, a drama unfolding. I mean, as long as there isn't any neurological disturbance, I wonder whether we need the term. I wonder what all we need is the term of the conflicts in revealing. So this is the conflict, con this is revealing. This is the drama. Don't reveal, isn't it? Don't you dare reveal what's going on. Say, don't reveal. Therefore, you have to deny what you see. Isn't that what's going on? Right? You have to falsify it. Then you're safe. <coughs> well, that's what we do. There are not many of us who can be ourselves and watch, the, watch it emerge, whatever follows. So our highest aspirations and all of the will and all of the dedication is interesting to produce and to bring into action, but you better start looking at the principles upon which you proceed. Otherwise, it's wasted. And that's the game of the dialectic in dreams and in philosophy. It's a fun one. <laughs> I took the wrong stack tonight. <laughs> now I think that's a problem of ignorance or providence. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>